Welcome to New Salem's virtual worship experience. Please keep watching after the sermon to hear important information and updates. Good morning, New Salem. My name is Daryl Scott, and I am representing the Deacon's Ministry this morning. I have the pleasure of leading the devotion. The scripture will be coming from Psalm 51, starting at the 10th verse. Psalm 51, 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thy God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart and a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to come and worship your holy name, Heavenly Father. We ask that you send your anointing on this service, Heavenly Father. Send down your spirit. Send down your spirit. Let it fall fresh on us today. Anoint as only you can, Heavenly Father, for prayers that will be prayed, to songs that will be sung, to that word that will be presented and spoken, Heavenly Father. We ask that you allow it to fall like manna from above to our hungry souls, Heavenly Father. Thank you for hearing our prayers today. We know and should take comfort, Heavenly Father, that you hear every prayer. More so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for knowing what we stand in need of, Heavenly Father. Bless in accordance to your perfect knowledge and your perfect will and your perfect way. Bless this church and bless these, your people, Heavenly Father. It's in the matchless name of Jesus that I pray and in his name that I thank you. Amen and amen. Oh 
Praise the Lord. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Wherever you are in your living room, your dining room, your bedroom, or your kitchen, I dare you to give God your best praise. Hallelujah. 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 Come on and put your hands together.
Salem. So excited to know that God found us exactly where we were. How many were lo in lost and found when God came and saw about you? He knew your particular circumstance. He knew your specific need. And he found you. Not only did he find you, but he picked you up. He dusted you off. He turned you all the way around. And you're a gift to him. He loves you and he knows you by name. Is there anybody in this place, and anybody under the sound of my voice, who can recognize and believe that God found you? He sought you out. His son, his daughter. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Oh, great. 
Good morning, New Salem family, friends, and guests. It's worship time. I want to invite you to the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church. My name is Chris Travers, for those who may not know me. And I have the, the privilege of serving as the director of young adults here at New Salem. And so our young adult department encompasses all folks between the age range of 18 to 35-ish, or how we like to say in the department, anybody who feels young adult in spirit. So we know we got some folks who've been 21 for the last two decades, but we still invite you <laughs> into our space. Amen. Amen. Um, before we get into the word that God placed in my heart, why don't you just drop in the chat if there's anything that God has brought you from this week. If you are thanking God for anything in this week, just share in the chat how good God has been to you. Amen, amen, amen. I want to take a second to thank a few folks before I get into my sermon. First and foremost, my pastor, Keith Troy. I thank you for this opportunity, Pastor. I thank you for allowing me the privilege um, to stand behind this pulpit. I thank you for your love and your guidance. Um, being on staff for almost a little over a year now, I'm quite confident that I'm probably the staff member who stresses you out the most. <laughs> but I thank you for your patience and the ways in which you pour into me each and every day. I also want to take a second to acknowledge our First Lady, Mrs. Troy, Minister Br Brenda Troy, the dopest First Lady around. Uh, I want to say thank you, Miss T, for being like a mother to me over the past year. Uh, with this pandemic, it's been quite difficult making it home, and so I thank you for your presence, for allowing me to be your fashion twin on the staff. Um, and I also want to say that I admire your strength and your devotion, not just to, to God, but your family as well as ministry. To all the New Salem staff, all full-time and part-time staff, I want to say thank you for your service, for your commitment to ministry, for your partnership. Um, this work can be difficult on a lot of days, but you all make it fun, and so I want to say thank you. To the life development young adult leaders, you know who you are. I don't know where I'd be without you, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for all the prayers, the encouragement, the inspiration. I am blessed, y'all, to be surrounded by some good praying folks. And so I thank y'all, and I love y'all. To my family in Baltimore, I want to shout out my siblings, my younger brother Matthew, my older brother Josh, my older sister Ania, who's also a minister. I want to shout out my mother, Helen Travers, and my father, Stephen Travers. Thank you uh, for just the ways in which you raised me. Thank you for how you pour into me. Thank you for how you listen to me and my stubborn ways. I appreciate you. Um, and before I stop, I'd be remiss if I didn't shout out one more family member, my niece, a.k.a. my firstborn child, Natalia Travers. Won't you join me, everybody, in wishing her a happy birthday? Natalia's turning 15 on the 22nd, and so I just want to pause and say happy birthday, Natalia. I love you, and I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to be your uncle. All right, y'all, let's get into it. I believe there's somebody tuning in this morning in desperate need of a word from God, and I do have a word to share with you. If you could, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 4 through 20. I'm going to tell you on the front end, we are reading a good bit of scripture today. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 4 through 20. Hopefully we can get that on the screen. And I'll be reading it from the New International Version this morning. The word of God reads, Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. 
As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Verse 19 reads, early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. The subject for our conversation this morning is from weeping to worship. If you're tuning in, watching this in community, I just encourage you to look over to your left and say, from weeping to worship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear from you. God, I have prepared and you have been with me in that preparation. I pray, Lord, that in this moment you would anoint me afresh. God, stand up in me. You know where I am weak. And so, Lord, I pray for your strength. I pray, God, that as folks witness this sermon, God, that they would not see me, but they would see you. I pray that somebody might be convicted by this word, Lord. And I promise, God, that if anything supernatural, transformative, amazing were to happen from this sermon, God, you and you alone will get the glory, honor, and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor, for as long as I can remember, I've been someone who is deeply connected to people, very relational in nature, and spent a good amount of time in conversation with others. I can fully remember, I can't fully remember when or how it started, but maybe from my early life years when I was playing sports, or maybe being raised by a mother who was also relational, but either way, if I don't do anything else, I am going to talk to people. I can recall being frustrated with my mother when we would go to church on Sundays because after sitting through what I already felt like was a pretty long service, my mother would then go around the church and talk to almost every single person in the church. My mom was one of those church members who would only leave once the deacons started flicking the lights. And even after we left the church, we had to go to the home of at least one of my aunts. And then we had to go to my grandma's house. And we would rarely get home while the sun was still up. Now what's funny about that is, now that I'm a little older, and spend a little bit more time in the church myself, I have become that person who has to talk to every single person before I leave. It's probably how I ended up pursuing a master's degree in counseling psychology or teaching students in the classroom or ultimately moving into full-time ministry. And the one thing I can say from most of the conversations I had with peers, family, friends, and even students, is that most folks deeply want something they do not have. And I believe that in the midst of this pandemic, it has only heightened the desire to have something you don't have. I hear stories about folks wanting to change jobs because the current one makes them miserable or wishing they had more money or wishing they didn't feel so alone or wishing the relationship would come back or wishing the marriage would be reconciled. Wishing, 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 wishing they could execute the business plan, wishing they could finish school, wishing they could trust people again, wishing they could change the way they look. The truth of the matter is all of us have been there. Is there anybody under the sound of my voice, whether it's virtually or in person, who knows what I'm talking about this morning? There are some things that you want that you currently don't have. I mean, I love God, and I believe God loves me, but I still want things. I still yearn 
for things. I still lay awake at night crying about not having some things. I struggle getting out of bed some mornings because of the pain of not having some things. I get a little envious of people on social media because I see that they have, but yet I don't. I know I'm not perfect, God. I know I don't always do things the right way, but surely I'm not as bad as some people. I often ask God, what about me? Anybody ever had a private Jesus, what about me moment? This might not be for all the super holy folks. It might not be for the super righteous, Holy Ghost filled folks. But I can honestly say that on a few occasions in this pandemic, I've had some what about me moments. I know the Bible says weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. But what do you do, pastor, when you wake up and you don't feel joy? When it feels like you're weeping night after night after night. Yes, I've had my fair share of what about me moments. And so has the main character in our text for this morning. Indeed, Hannah has also experienced her fair share of what about me moments, her fair share of weeping moments. Hannah knows what it's like not to have something and to want it desperately. To go to sleep and wake up with the tears in your eyes because you look up and your circumstances haven't changed. For context this morning, Hannah is the wife of Elkanah who's also married to Penina. And while Her Hannah is barren, Penina has several children. And every chance she got, Penina would antagonize Hannah about her inability to get pregnant. So we got Alcana, we got Hannah, we got Penina. Hannah's barren, Penina has children. Pastor always says you don't have to watch cable or, or Hulu or Netflix to get entertainment if you are looking for a Love and Hip Hop storyline or a Housewives of Potomac storyline, all you have to do is pick up your Bible and read it. So Hannah desperately wanted to have a son. And not only could she not, but she was constantly reminded of the fact of it by Penina. And so it's important to note that during Hannah's time within this heavily patriarchal society, a woman's value was not just connected to having a husband, but also to having children. It wasn't just about pleasing her husband. Hannah felt like her very worth, identity, and purpose was tied up in having a son. And despite being overwhelmed with grief because she was barren, despite what it looked like, Hannah still had strong faith that God would grant her a son. And so in examining the sequence of events in this story, I believe there's much to be gained in following Hannah's movements. In fact, I believe there are three key lessons we can learn from Hannah, even in her weeping over not having something that she desperately wanted. If you're someone who enjoys taking notes, the first point I'd like to raise in our conversation this morning is that Hannah teaches us that we need to talk less to people and pray more to God. Talk less to people and pray more to God. I promise I'm in the text. Let's go to verse six. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Verse seven says, this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Now, as we examine these verses, we can see that despite Penina's attacks, Hannah remain silent. Hannah chooses not to respond to Penina. She could have easily got into a verbal confrontation with Penina. She could have dragged her about her children. She could have made fun of her about the fact that Elkanah clearly loves Hannah more than he loves Penina, but Hannah chooses to be silent. But there's more. Verse 8 says, her husband, Elkanah, would say to Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? But even with the barrage of questions from her husband and the somewhat insensitive approach, 
we still don't see a verbal response from Hannah. Instead, the Bible says Hannah stood up, made her way to the Lord's house, and in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord. I wonder how much more peace we might have as believers if we talk less to people and pray more to God. I, I wonder how much closer we would be to our breakthrough if we talk less to people and prayed more to God. Come here, David. I wonder how many more giants we might slay if we talk less to people and prayed more to God. Come here, Daniel. I wonder how many more lion dens we could survive in if we talk less to people and prayed more to God. Come here, Joshua. I wonder how many more Jerichos we might conquer if we talk less to people and prayed more to God. Come here, children of Israel. I wonder how much sooner we could get through our wilderness if we talk less to people and prayed more to God. I dare you this week, start tracking how often you talk about your situation to people versus how much you pray about your situation to God. See, we spend way too much time talking about our issues and our circumstances with people who don't need to be involved and you wonder why you have no peace. I promise I'm really just, I'm just preaching to myself in this moment. It's really just Chris talking to me. I'm an external processor and I told y'all at the beginning of this message, I'm also relational. And so when I go through stuff, I oftentimes want to call somebody and share what I'm going through. And I get convicted oftentimes because God says, why are you talking to them more than you're talking to me? I got some paninas, some alkinas in my life that I need to stop responding to and follow Hannah's example. Stand up and go pray to my father. We notice that Hannah didn't respond to any of it. She's teaching us that we have to talk less to people and pray more to God. But that's not it. Hannah is also showing us that we have to allow our frustrations to fuel our desperation. Hannah has found herself in what most folks would describe as an unchangeable situation. And not only does she have to deal with her own insecurity and status as a barren wife, but she also is forced to watch Penina bully, mock, and antagonize her in the midst of it. I can imagine that in addition to the grief and sorrow that Hannah felt, she was also angry. I can imagine that Hannah was also frustrated. Her current circumstances didn't match what she believed to be the call in her life. I'm gonna say it again. Her current circumstances didn't match what she believed to be the call in her life. I'm gonna say it again. Her current circumstances didn't match what she believed to be the call in her life. I'm gonna say it again because I think there's somebody that listening to me right now who is struggling because your current circumstances don't match the call that you believe is on your life. Situation doesn't match what you believe God can and will do through you. And despite Hannah's strong faith, I can just sense that she was sitting in some frustration. I could, I could hear Hannah saying, God, this feels like it's too much. God, this feels too hard. God, this feels too heavy. God, this feels too painful. But it's the frustration, y'all, the grief, the sorrow, and the what about me feeling that ultimately makes Hannah desperate. I'm just wondering, are there any desperate folks under the sound of my voice this morning? Any desperate folks in the house? Hannah gets desperate. And in her desperation, she not only prays, but she makes a promise to God. Verse 11 reads, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. She doesn't try to take the situation in her own hands. When we think about some of the previous barren women in the Bible, they try to take the situation of having children into their own hands. Hannah, Hannah does not do that. What Hannah does instead is takes her desperation and goes to the person who she believes can help her in her situation. But we can also sense the level of desperation and urgency in Hannah by how she prayed. Verse 12 says, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. 
Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Not only was it an inaudible prayer, it was also an intense prayer. I love this right here because I think sometimes as believers, we have a tendency to overly formalize some stuff. We worry that we don't know what to say to God or we don't know how to say it. We worry how we might look when people see us praying down at the altar, sobbing. But are you desperate enough to pray in your heart and just move your lips? Are you desperate enough to look crazy to some folks? Are you desperate to get to the doorpost even if you can't get inside the building? I wonder, are you desperate enough to just say Abba? Even if you don't have any other words. I don't know if God is as concerned with how eloquent your delivery is more than he is with your heart and how desperate you are for him. Hannah is showing us that we have to allow our frustrations to fuel our desperation. So two points, Hannah tells us, she's showing us, talk less to people, Pray more to God. Allow your frustrations to fuel your desperation. But there's one more. The final lesson that I believe we can get from Hannah's story is worship turns God's attention. Worship turns God's attention. How do I know this? It's a great question. Let's go to the text. In verse 19, it reads, Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her. I became super intrigued by the phrase, the Lord remembered her. And as I reflected on this, Ms. T, I I had to ask the question, what does it mean when it says the Lord remembered her? So I did some research. The original Hebrew verb for remembered is zahah. And so the meaning of the verb is not just to remember, it also includes acting on behalf of the one brought to mind. And we see this mentioned a few times in the Bible. Let's go to Genesis chapter eight, verse one, where God remembered Noah and all the animals and livestock and he sent a wind over the earth and the waters subsided. Or in Genesis chapter 30, verse 22, when God remembered Rachel and enabled her to conceive. So when we see God remembered in the text, it literally means God turns his attention and then acts on the person's behalf. And so the Bible says God remembered Hannah. And so the next question that popped up in my head was, well, what ultimately led God to turn his attention to Hannah and act on her behalf? Clearly, I was that kid in the classroom that if you allowed me to have like one question and you answered it, I was going to come up with like one or two more questions that I need to answer to. And so I'm just talking to God in the same way. But on a serious note, I got to wondering, what was it? What was it that turned God's attention? Did God turn his attention directly after the weeping? Or when Hannah made her way to the doorpost to pray? Was it the desperation of her petition to God? Was it the way she responded to Eli? Was it her patience in dealing with Penina and how she never clapped back? What was it? that ultimately caused God to shift his attention. And in my reflection, I kept coming back to the beginning of verse 19. It says, early the next morning, they arose and worshiped. And the Hebrew meaning for worship is to literally bowed out. So on the day after Hannah had been consistently provoked by her rival, misunderstood by her husband, on the day after where she was deeply anguished and weeping bitterly, where she couldn't do anything else but run to God in desperation, 
despite nothing in the natural changing in Hannah's situation, despite not being pregnant at the moment, and despite no real guarantee that anything would change, Hannah got up early the next morning and bowed down to God. And then God turned his attention and acted on her behalf. I believe God was concerned with Hannah's condition. I believe God was concerned with the bullying that she was subjected. I, I believe God was concerned with the hate, the hurt, the pain of being barren. I believe God heard her prayer, but I also believe it was the worship that ultimately turned God's attention. See, it's, it's one thing to give God praise as a result of something that he's done. It's something else to wake up and to look around and see that nothing has moved but to still bow down in reverence to God. See, to bow down is a sign of surrendering. It's a, it's a sign of submission. It's a declaration that you are God, you are sovereign, you are in control. I honor you, I acknowledge you, I live for you. It's something different when you bow down. I want this thing to change in my life, God. I want it to change desperately, but even if it doesn't, I bow down. See, I think we get worship confused with praise. I think we believe sometimes that the two words are synonymous. And so I want to say thank you to my brother Denarian Lewis for educating some of the young adults, including myself, and our last unscripted about the difference between praise and worship. Hopefully I get it right. See, praise emanates from the acts of God. Thank you, God, for the car. I praise you, God, for making a way. I bless you, God, for bringing my child home safely. See, that's praise, but worship, worship is something different. Worship is an adoration for God simply for who he is and what he means to you, even if Nothing comes, God, I worship you. Even if the blessing never lands on my doorstep, God, I worship you. What Hannah demonstrated was a clear and definitive statement that God, for you I live and for you I die. That God, your will is what's best for me. That God, your way is what's best for me. God, I trust you. God, I follow you. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, you are still God and you are still good. And I choose to bow down. I'm wondering if there are any worshipers listening to this message this morning, the kind that don't have to be on a mountain or the kind that don't have to be in a building or the kind that don't need to be in a pew or in a choir loft. Are there any true worshipers listening to this message? The type of worshipers that believe in worshiping in the, the Father and Spirit and in truth. I believe it was the worship that ultimately turned God's attention. I can hear God saying, I know it's hard right now. I know it hurts right now. I know it's painful right now. I know it seems like Penina is getting everything and I've forgotten about you. I know it doesn't seem fair, but I want you to worship. I'll turn my attention, but can I have yours? Don't give in. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. Come to me. Bow down and worship. So we have three very clear points that I believe are illustrated in this story with Hannah. The first, talk less to people. Pray more to God. The second, allow your frustrations to fuel your desperation. The third, worship turns God's attention. But the thing about this, y'all, and close this message. Hannah isn't the only model we have of what it looks like to move from weeping to worship. We certainly have another example of what it means to move from weeping to worship. I often think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Dr. Ruffin. 
Jesus was in the garden. Jesus takes Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And the Bible says he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He goes on to say, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He even asked God, Jesus, even asked God, if it's possible, please remove this cup. In other words, I'd rather not do it. It's too hard for me. It's too tough for me. Father, it's too much for me. But even in his sorrow, even in his grief, even in his pain, even in what some folks might describe as his most vulnerable moment, Jesus illustrates what it looks like to move from weeping to worship. Because Jesus closes that prayer by saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And because Jesus followed through with his assignment, because Jesus died on the cross and took the penalty for you and for me, we have a chance at redemption. We have a chance at relationship. We have a chance at salvation. And because he stayed true to his assignment, he now sits on the right hand of the Father advocating on our behalf. But more than that, Jesus can empathize with our condition. Jesus can empathize with our struggle. He knows what it feels like to move from weeping to worship family. I wanna, I wanna pray over you in this moment. And this is not for everybody. This is for a select group of folks who are tuning into this worship experience. If you find yourself struggling, similar to how Hannah struggled, you find yourself wanting something so badly and you're believing that God can and will provide, but you just don't see it yet in this moment. I wanna pray for you right where you are. I just encourage you to, to build an altar right where you are, bow down and get into a posture of worship as we go to God in prayer. Father, I thank you for reminding us that trouble won't last always. Father, I thank you for yet again coming to see about us in this moment. God, I suspect that there are folks, your children, who are going through in this moment, God, similar to how your daughter Hannah was going through. Lord, you know their circumstance. You know what keeps them up at night, Father, and I am asking you, to cover them in this moment, God. To grant them peace in this moment, Lord God. To be the God that they need you to be in this moment, God. I pray that this message would help them to talk less to people and pray more to you. To take their frustration and allow it to fuel their desperation. And to make sure that their worship gets your attention. God, if there's a person watching this right now who does not know you, I pray, Lord, that their spirit might be convicted. They might ask, what must I do to be saved? And they might take the step to begin to have relationship with you. I thank you for what you've already done. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We certainly open up the doors of the church, allow you the opportunity to become a part of God's family. We're excited about what God can do, will do, and has done. There are three ways that you can connect to God through the church family. You can send a text to 614-568-4800. You can send an email to nsprayerministry at newsalem.cares.com 
and visit the church at NewSalemCares.com backslash connect. Those are the three ways you can connect. We'll be excited for you to become a part of the New Salem family, but more important, the kingdom of God. It's time for giving here at the New Salem Church. We are grateful that we're now into a new year and a new season and God continues to be a blessing to us and we want to be a blessing to others. So we ask you to give thought and prayer to being obedient to what God has directed us to do in our giving and in our stewardship. There are five different ways you can give at New Salem. You can visit church.newsalemcares backslash give. Secondly, you can use the Shelby Next app Third thing you can do is use our cash app, dollar sign NS Cares. The fourth thing you can do is text your amount to 614-333-0656. And the final thing you can do is you just want to take a drive and get out for some air, is come by the church and drop the gift off here at the church. So we're excited for what God is going to allow us to do through our obedience in our stewardship. We'll encourage you to stay tuned to our top five announcements so that you can find out what's going on in New Salem this week and coming weeks as we get prepared to start the new year and the new quarter. There's some exciting things that's going to happen. And please stay tuned for the top five announcements. Greetings, New Salem family and all our special guests. These are your top five announcements for this week. Number one, calling all married couples. Invest in your marriage and join the Marriage Ministries Virtual Marriage Conference Friday, February 26th from 7 to 9 p.m. on Zoom. The theme for this free conference is Let's Talk Marriage, Building Strong and Healthy Relationships. Registration closes Thursday, February 25th. Go to the church website or e-newsletter for more information. Number two. Mark your calendars and save the date. Columbus Virtual Citywide Revival starts Sunday, March 21st, and will run through Wednesday, March 24th. Watch for more information in the coming weeks. Number three, 10th and 11th grade high school students and parents. Are you ready to start applying to colleges? Join the youth ministry for the college application process workshop Thursday, February 25th from 6.30 to 8 o'clock p.m. on Zoom. Go to the church website and e-newsletter to register. Number four. Today is the official kickoff of the Health and Wellness Ministries Walk It Out seven-day walk competition. Throughout the week, we will be recording our steps to improve our health and to go for the big trophy. Stay tuned for updates on social media. And number five, tune in to Wellness Wednesday on Facebook Live and YouTube Live at 5 o'clock p.m. This week's special guest is pediatrician Jennifer Walton, who will share the latest information related to the COVID-19 vaccine and children and answer questions from the chat box. All of these announcements can be found on church.newsalemcares.org or in the link below. Please follow us on social media for updates and information throughout the week. These are your top five announcements. Have a wonderful week.